everybody. I promised we would be back this week. No more weeks off for us. Uh, and we are back. I am, of course, Jordan DuPont, your host of the Four Star Podcast, joined as always by Nick Nicola, Tig Mullen, and Andrew Freeman. You can find the show on Twitter, which I guess is getting rebranded to X. At Four we're Star Pod CHI. Who knows? <laughs> no, we're not unpacking that. I just saw an Who opportunity knows? for a joke and took it. I'm sure it'll uh, change so- something else within a week or so. Yeah. Probably. <laughs> um, so again, we are at Four Star Pod CHI. Nick is at Nicola21. Tig is at TM Mullen007. Andrew is at AJ Freeman25. And check out Four Star Pod CHI.com for our latest episodes, uh, a little bit about us, and any blog posts, although I don't think we've written any month but anyway it's there if you want it uh without further ado really let's... dropped the ball on that one <laughs> yeah i was like i'm gonna write blog posts we were so excited <laughs> i i will i generally yeah. i will get back no, into he, it i just it, he's had a lot going on yeah, that was a lot. a lot going on we gotta we gotta give him a little slack here yep um but yeah let's start uh digging into the cubs um i just made a comment before we started recording oh we get to be positive for once and they're like do we do we but I'm hey, we're coming off. We're we're coming off of two uh, good series wins. Um, one of which was a four game set against the Cardinals. So we won three out of four there, and that was a lot of fun. Um, we lost our opener against the Nationals, but then won the final two games. Um, what are we four games below 500 right now? With a, about a week before the we, trade deadline, we so. are. Uh, three games under all i know is that we're five wow. games behind in the wild card <laughs> i think because yep. like the giants yep. lost today we are and to make the joke again <laughs> just when i think i'm out <laughs> they pull me right back in <laughs> um i don't know personally i guess i'm just gonna do the majority of the talking here to to start with but i mean i'm hopeful um i know jed said the watermark for being buyers versus sellers wasn't necessarily where we're at in the standings. 500 was the watermark. And we've got uh, two games against the White Sox, I think three in St. Louis and one in Cincinnati before the deadline. So we could be at or above 500 very feasibly going into the trade deadline, uh, which would mean that we get to keep Cody Bellinger and Marcus Stroman. So I'm crossing my fingers. (laughs) I'll let you guys unpack a little bit here, but. Yeah, I don't know. I think um, I'll kind of return to what I said. I don't know. Gosh, I don't know what episode it was. But uh, you know, I've made the point before of like, we don't necessarily have to be buyers. We just like, for the love of God, just like, I don't think there's any reason to be sellers. <laughs> you know, and I understand that like, especially with baseball, you know, football, you don't really get this whole like crazy sell off buying thing. Like it, it's really a baseball thing. And I don't know basketball or hockey enough. Well, to talk NBA about that, but can have a pretty crazy deadline. Hockey, hockey, yeah, yeah. Hockey That's deadlines get pretty crazy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah. So like, but like, is it really, it's just one of those things where it's like, I understand that it's, a, it's frustrating for us as Cubs fans to be like constantly doing this, but that's part of the problem is like, well, when you sell every year and then you have to like reconstruct your roster, like just hang on to some of these guys, the Bellinger and Stroman question are questions because of the contract negotiations that inevitably will happen because Bellinger will be cashing in on that on this year, which is what he tried doing. He has Scott Boris as his agent. We know Shohei is probably going to be a free agent, hopefully, unless the team that gets him, if the team does. I saw today that the Diamondbacks and the Orioles, yeah, those are two names. They're the ones inquiring about him first, so that's kind of crazy. But regardless, it's like, how do we handle the luxury tax? If, if they want to just ignore the luxury tax, I hope we do. And then... How do we approach Bellinger, who doesn't have great analytics but is having a great year? How do we approach Stroman, who's having a good year? I mean, he's had he's gotten roughed up a bit, but he's still a guy that I would love to have near the top of my order uh, rotation. Excuse me. Um, and where do we go from here? So I don't know. I'm excited. Let's see. <laughs> I I want to be excited. I. I, I want to be. <laughs> I especially <I> <laughs> want to be excited. I want to be excited. It's like, hey, I want to be like Jordan, where it's like, hey, we won our last two series. We're inching closer to 500. We're near that watermark. But every, what has been the story with this team all year? The second they start to get hot, they cool off in a horribly painful way, and then they lose like five or six. They lose all these super close one run games. And at this point in the season, it's like if they don't win these next two against the White Sox, that might be it. Like they might be calling up. It's like, all right, what do you want? What do you want for Stroman? What do you want for Bellinger? And like like I said 
you know, I think I said last week is like, I don't want to see that happen because the, you know, the clubhouse impact of having these two guys, not just who are great on the field, but great clubhouse guys being sold off again for like the third year in a row, not these guys specifically. And I've seen, you know, some people be like, hey, well, hey, maybe they come back in free agency. I don't know about that. Like, how many times has that actually happened where yeah i don't think i don't think like cody having boris's free agent or is his agent i don't think boris won't no not boris won't uh well boris Boris won't but (laughs) um yeah yeah uh cody won't stroman maybe but like again how many times has that actually happened i could think of chapman and i think jason hamill when we traded him i think in 20 14 or 15 or something like that. I think we, we traded, traded him like him. multiple times. We, and got the we game traded him the game. Yeah. yeah. Right. Basic. I, those are the only two names I can think of where it's like, Hey, we dealt you at the deadline, but then you could come back the next year. And you know, it's like, I, I don't know. know. My, would, my oh. rebuttal to at least the Bellinger situation, if we do get rid of him, um, he, first of all, we're the team that gave him the opportunity to rebuild himself and he's done it successfully. I think that has some weight. Um, I can't remember who was getting counterpoint to that point. He's a Boris client money and term has a lot. Oh, for sure. For sure. I'm going to end this whole (laughs) counterpoint. counterpoint, Carlos Correa did stay with the twins. I mean, yeah, he tried going to three teams, but he did. (laughs) Well, yeah, I'm going to end this for his third choice and, Minus $150 million <laughs> later because apparently he just has nothing in his knee or something like that. His knees just don't exist. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to end this whole caveat with saying, obviously, the Cubs need to pay up. This is all disregarding the money factor for now. But that's um, that's the thing. You can't disregard the money right, factor for right, but you, it, because it, that's that's always going to be the story that. with this team. I understand that, but I think – we're finally in a position where we're showing forward momentum. The comeback win against the Cardinals. Um, what day of the week was that? I don't know. It, it was the second to last game in the series. Um, Cause I didn't watch the last one, but where we were down four separate times and then wound up winning the game. Yeah. Saturday. The team has not shown that capability at all this year up to that point. So I think that is turning a corner. Um, but it, I think during that game, uh, T Mac was doing a little sideline piece, and I can't remember who she was talking about. It might have been Steele. Um, but one of the guys in the clubhouse is like, Yeah, Cody Bellinger is the best clubhouse guy I have ever been around. Doesn't matter if he's in a 0 for 40 slump or he's going 40 for 40, he's even keeled, he's positive, he's building up everybody around him. Look, so, man, you smoked that much dope and look that high. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he'll be chilling in the clubhouse, too. Um, but uh, his his clubhouse presence is very strong. He's He has publicly said how much he loves playing in Chicago, which honestly... I don't, I, 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 I don't put that much stock in that. If everybody comes to Chicago, they say... No, I understand Chicago, that. But it, he's again, be, I'm, I'm disregarding if, money here. I'm just I, saying he would be Especially during the summer in Chicago. Everyone wants to exactly. be in the summer. <laughs> if, uh, it, all, all I'm saying is if you remove money from the equation, I think there's a strong possibility he would be open to returning. Now, with all that being said, obviously there is the money equation. And again, we're about $5 million below the luxury tax right now. We were willing to go above the luxury tax. uh, 20, I think 2015 or 2016 was the first year that we went above it. And look what happened. Um, So I think if our team shows a strong enough push and Cody Bellinger keeps doing, obviously this is an unsustainable pace, but if he keeps playing close to the level that he's been playing at in the month of July, which is the best hitter in baseball currently, I think the Ricketts family would be willing to spend the money to sign him to a deal that he would deserve and would be willing to come back on. Sorry. It also comes down (laughs) to, yeah. I mean, it also comes down to like, what could you get in a trade? Because that's that's really, that's what I'm worried about. That's really what it, like if teams are willing to give you a good offer where you're getting a legitimate 
yeah, prospect or two. Leave it. Yeah, but for and, two months of two months of Bellinger well, at this dude, point. I mean, I'm just saying, all right, because again, you guys know me. My second team's the Padres. AJ Preller overbuys on dudes <laughs> like crazy. <laughs> he is overpaid on the rental for uh Adam Frazier. That didn't pan out. Josh Bell, that didn't pan out. Brandon Jury, he let him go, which he shouldn't have. He overpaid for Austin Nola. Like he could totally overpay for Bellinger. My step, or excuse me, my father in law was like texting me, like, we need Bellinger. And I was like, yeah, we'll see, buddy, because <laughs> I can see the Padres giving us somebody crazy because Preller, like, is desperate to hang on his job. And then we just get Cody back after the free agency because he does. He'll, he'll I, buy the rental and then he'll let him go. I mean, in my mind, it would have to be somebody who's a, either a position player who's like really close to MLB ready with a high ceiling or somebody. Or like a pitching prospect with like super high potential. I don't. I don't know the Padres. I will say this: that well. if if the Padres are willing to give us Jackson Merrill, he's a few years away. But if they're willing to give us Jackson Merrill, we take Jackson Merrill. I'm telling you, that's well, the is one. He, kid. Is he just one of those like untouchable prospects that we basically have no shot at getting? Mm, well, that's the thing. Is, is <laughs> that's initially, the thing well, though. that's the thing. People thought that he was, and then well, people also thought guys were untouchable last year for Soto. And then people thought that, like, people now, like, from the Padre beat writers are like, actually, we don't know. Merrill might not be untouchable. And then there's this guy, Salas. I think he's untouchable because he's 17 and he's, like, ripping through everybody. But Merrill just got up to double A and he's ahead of schedule right now. So I would take him if we get Cody and then potentially get Cody back. Yeah, I would do that trade. Okay. I just think realistically, and this is where it all comes down to for me, um, you know, like Nick's been alluding to, we've been sellers for a few years. We have significantly built up our farm system in the past couple of years. Um, I think we've got three or four guys at double A or above uh, that are pretty solid outfield prospects that we're not going to have room for. I mean, we just extended Ian Happ. We still have a few years left on Seiya. Um, You know, Morrell was supposed to play center. They're just going to stick Morel wherever. Yeah, he's, he's I, right. Which uh, not complaining, not complaining. The arm, the arm play is all over the diamond. But for me, it, it, when it comes to trading away Stro and belly, I don't think the return is there because I would want like Nick saying an almost MLB ready top 20 or 30 in the respective teams, farm system guy. And I don't think a lot of teams are going to be willing to give that up for two months of Cody Bellinger or Marcus Stroman right. to only have the potential to lose them again in free agency. Yeah, kind of. What so Jordan to me, was, it just makes sense to hang on to them. Kind of what Jordan was alluding to there. I wasn't when I said that it wasn't me saying I think this is a realistic offer for these guys. Right. Maybe if you package them together, you get one of those guys. But it, even then, I don't know. Um, I'm saying that is what I think the Cubs would have to get in return for it to be worth it and for it to like make it look like okay we're at least getting this guy he's coming up next year rather than it's okay we're getting another prospect who we might see in two years um for it, it to be worth it rather than just keeping everybody trying to make a push for this year you don't even have to buy anybody this year or uh, but yeah yeah and i have a fire sale yeah exactly <laughs> yeah, and so, that's, yeah, and that's all we're asking don't have to go back sale. to the beginning of our talk and i i agree with you guys in the end of the day i think that's what we'd like to do how i said before we don't necessarily have to be buyers or sellers just keep the team and then fix it in the off season i'm just yeah. saying if we do do it right let's try to get value because it's yeah. gonna suck <laughs> if we do this again <laughs> Yeah, you know. I'll say this, like, if you're not going to, like, if you're in a position, like, let's say they hover on the same record they're at or same place in the standings that they're at by the trade deadline. If you're not going to trade Bellinger, you better sign him in oh, the offseason. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's – there's that fine there's that fine line to where, like, yeah, you don't want to – I guess there's, there's the argument of, like, sending that message to the locker room of, you know, selling all the time and, and, and whatnot. But at the same time, it's like if, if Bellinger ends up just being a one-year rental, that's a huge missed opportunity mm -hmm. to not get something in return. Right. And him. one would think the fact that we were willing to take the flyer on it would make no sense to take the flyer on him with the with the expectation of you had a great year, you can go. Right. <laughs> right. Well, so here's, that makes no here's sense. Here's the other thing that we haven't mentioned yet. Um, so it, the reason Belly is a little bit – I would say more likely to stay is because he's still eligible for a qualifying offer. Marcus Stroman is not. And for those of you that don't know what a qualifying offer is, it's a 
set contract amount that you offer to a veteran player at the end of their contract. If they refuse it, they enter free agency, but then you receive a draft uh, compensatory draft pick in the next year's draft from the team that winds up signing the player. I don't so Marcus, think, do I don't think that's that? more incentive for uh, you said Bellinger is eligible for that, but Stroman isn't. Correct. Correct. So I don't all think- ins- all, the only reason I'm saying he's more likely to stay is because then we can attach the qualifying offer to him, which we know he's going to refuse, receive an extra draft pick. And I know MLB draft picks aren't as valuable, but that does hurt the team that's looking to sign him. Oh, you meant you meant stay as in stay here through the, through the deadline. Through, through the de- okay. Through the I deadline. thought you meant yes. like yeah. No, okay, no, no, no. Just okay. just through the deadline. My mistake. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I just so- I just misunderstood what you were saying. No, you're, you're good. Um, so yeah, I think that's why belly would be more likely to stay through the deadline than Stro would, because we don't have the option to, to give him that qualifying offer. Um, but yeah, Andrew, I completely agree with what you're saying. It, it, it's not just a matter of keeping these guys and not being buyers or sellers. It really is. Okay. If, if we're going to keep them through the deadline, you better be freaking working on an extension for the rest of the season. Because oh, like if I if I'm then I'm like I'm trying to get a, a hammer away an extension before the deadline. If their plan is not to trade these guys, like let's try to get a, a deal done right before they even get to free. It's, it's unlikely that would happen because they're gonna they're gonna want to hit the open market and try to get as much as they can. But I'd be if I'm the Cubs, like I'm trying to hammer something down before that even happens, right? Because you don't want to run that risk of just letting them go <laughs> and. Not getting anything right. returned. But worry. that's that's the problem right now is we've put ourselves in this position where we're still not – it's still 50-50 on what we're going to do based on our record and how the guys have been playing. So it's hard for – like I think Jed's come out – okay, maybe Jed hasn't said it, but it's kind of understood that they're waiting to see – what they're able, what offers get generated for Stroh and Belly and see if it's going to be worth it to trade them, where the team is going to be at. And I'm saying if we're in a position where we don't have to have a sell-off again, August 2nd, you better be calling up Scott Boris and whoever Stroh's agent is and starting to work on an extension. Because if you keep these guys through the trade deadline and they wind up walking in free agency, you missed an opportunity. Wait, another, another thing. To, I'll, I'll let Ty go first. But. Uh, sorry, it was real quick. I do worry what like our AAV though would be for Bellinger because it's like I don't. I do like Bellinger a lot. I love him, but like, man, I don't want to. I don't want to break the bank on just him, and then free agency comes around in the off season, and we're like, we can't get anybody. But that's the thing. <laughs> like again, we're we're the third largest media market in the country. The Cubs yeah. have yeah, that's not our owners. <laughs> that's not how they operate. That's no, I know. Chicago but, sports yeah, operate don't, don't operate like a big market. They all operate like small market team owners who don't want to who act like they're they're poor, don't have any cash. And I mean, that was the other thing I was going to bring up before. Kind of Ty kind of mentioned it, but it's like you know, if you want to put yourself into the Shohei sweepstakes this coming off season like you kind of need as much money as possible to kind of make that happen because he's going to be demanding all the money and quite frankly if i'm going to be giving somebody all the money i'd rather do it for shohei than if i had to choose i'd rather do it for shohei obviously than cody bellinger because again (laughs) bellinger he's it's he's had it before this year he's been on a downward trend in terms of his production, whereas Shohei is the best player in baseball. So. Yeah, and if you do uh, want to put stock the best into, ever. <laughs> and if you do want to put stock into analytics, like again, Cody's despite the great year, his analytics are down, which is the scary part. That's why I'm kind of worried about how much of an AV we'd give him. I like him. I think that's great. Yeah, I don't know. I'm scared, but I'm also excited. Who knows? We can move on. <laughs> Anybody have anything else they want to bring up on the Cubs or no? Nah. Keep going for, okay, so then I'll end how I normally do, uh, preview what we got coming up. Um, like we had mentioned, we start a two-game set against the White Sox for the Crosstown Classic. That is not nearly as exciting as it used to be in the early 2000s. Uh, that is tomorrow and Wednesday. Um, after that, we go to St. Louis, I believe, for three games. Um, and then after that we've got uh the reds um and there's only one game against the reds before the trade deadline which kind of stinks because again we're trying to see where we're at in the standings and we're chasing the reds uh so it'd be nice if we got a full series in there but just the one game uh so moving on from there uh looks like we have some blackhawks news so i will turn that over to nick and andrew who are kind of the resident blackhawks people 
yeah, uh, nothing major with the Blackhawks, just a few uh, contract signings. Uh, the big one, of course, uh, the Blackhawks made Connor Bedard even more official, like officially official. Uh, he signed his uh, entry level contract on his 18th birthday. I'm assuming that's because NHL rules are you can't sign a contract till you turn 18. So, United States law is you can't sign a contract until you're ah, 18. Well, well, there you go. There yep. you go. They're, they literally had it circled on the calendar. It's like, all right, you're signing. You're signing today. Uh, three years, uh, nine hundred twenty-five thousand dollars a year, which is great value for a contract, especially if yeah. Connor Bedard is a superstar. We expect him to be so, <laughs> and it's great that he's forced to sign that. <laughs> yep. It's, oh, I mean, you know, great for us, obviously. Because uh, um, three years from now, that number is going to be a hell of a lot higher. It's going to be maybe like 15 times that, probably, yeah. <laughs> yeah. if I had to guess. Um, Roughly. So uh, that's a big one. Another draft pick. Uh, I mentioned We mentioned him on the podcast after the draft, but uh, Marcel Marcel, the dude from – his name is Marcel Marcel. He was the, he was the big dude. He's like 6'4", 240. Um, I don't remember what country he's from. Um, I think he's – Ah, fuck, I'm going to look this up. You, uh, you talk, I'll look it up. Uh, okay, so Marcel Marcel. Um, the Rockford Ice Hogs signed him to a one-year AHL, AHL deal, so uh, he's going to be playing in Rockford this year, which is very exciting. He's actually getting some you know, North American uh, hockey experience, I guess. Um, and, you know, the Hawks will be able to monitor his development better, so that's exciting. Um, back to the uh, NHL team, Philip Kurashev, um, they ruled on his arbitration hearing. Uh, he, he signed a two year, $2.25 million a year deal. And he's a, just another solid forward. So that's about it. So, uh, Marcel, Marcel is Chechen. Yes. Which means, uh, he is from the Czech Republic, but yeah. from like, Oh, I thought you meant the Czech the side of I thought Czech you meant the different yeah. Chechnya. I thought right. you meant like Chechnya, man. Yeah, no, like, no, wow. I got scared for a second. Not, <laughs> no, not not Chechnya, Czech, Czechia. Czech Republic. I think I'm saying that right. So yeah, Czech Republic. He's Czech. He's not Czech. Czech. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Anyway, well, yeah, that's that's about all I have on the Hawks. Cool. Yeah, I got nothing to really add. All right. Well. uh a little bit of Bears news, uh, Andrew. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can start with the Bears news, I guess. Uh, so, yeah, training camp's coming up, so getting really excited for that. Uh, we've had a couple of news um, for the Bears heading the training camp, though. Uh, <laughs> the main one is the whole Chase Claypool fiasco, which is just hilarious because – so, first of all, it gets announced yesterday that – Chase Claypool is being put on the pup list or the physically unable to perform list, which basically it is what it sounds like, right? Player gets put on that list and they're physically not able to practice or anything. You know, Claypool, he's been kind of dealing with a minor injury throughout the off season. Um, and then we get the news later today, I guess earlier today that he's no longer on the pup list. So everyone freaked out on Twitter for like a good, I don't know, 12 hours that Chase Claypool is already up to no good, not being healthy for practices. And then a day later he's healthy for practices again. So, I mean, my take on it and the general feeling that I'm getting um, is that um, with people that I talk to is that is, it was always a minor thing that they put him on the pup list just so their doctors could take a quick look at him and kind of clear him before, like he's there early right now. He doesn't have to report. Um, so he, apparently he reported early so he, that he could get checked out by the team's medical staff, team medical staff checked him out and seems like he's fine. So are you sure they didn't do it just to mess with bears Twitter? They also might've done that to mess with bears Twitter because <laughs> bears Twitter is like the most gullible That's true. reactionary <laughs> group of bunch. Like I've ever seen. What? It's just, I don't know, man. Chicago you should see the Chargers general. Twitter. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, Twitter has the best social media account ever. Yeah. Long. True. The what I'm curious about though is like I am so I see what you're saying, but like it allows the doctors to check them out. Why can't doctors just look at them anyways? Like what what are the doctors there for? <laughs> like why is he, why do I have to get designated to be physically unable to perform just know. to get my probably knee checked out or whatever? Probably some like union rule or uh, yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah, probably I wouldn't be surprised if it had something to do with the CBA. Uh, but the other funny thing was, yeah. uh, and I, I saw people using this as a reaction 
when the Claypool news came out was that like a week ago, Justin Fields is like, Oh yeah, Chase is looking great. He's all ready to go. Like I'm super excited and all this stuff. And he was like, working out with Justin. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're like, what? <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's why Just, I, that's... Justin trains hard. <laughs> uh, yeah, he does. That's why the whole thing never made sense to me. Like I tweeted out that it was, it was you know, not ideal for him to start off on the pup list, but like, yeah, it, the back of my head never made sense because he was like, he was working out with Justin like right before training camp kicked off. Yep. So he had so, to be somewhat healthy to work it, out. You know? It doesn't help that like it happened on a Sunday and a Monday and like right. we can't talk to them until tomorrow, you know? So then it's <laughs> yeah. like everybody's like, ah! so I guess while we're talking about the bears, um, two sound bites that we haven't talked about yet uh, that I kind of want to get your reactions to just very briefly. First one being Justin Fields calling a shot that he's going to be the first 4,000 yard passer in bears history. And he's doing it in the 2023 season. How do we feel about that? I mean, you better, it's not I that like hard it. to do in the 17 game yeah. season. You know, it's funny. <laughs> well, that, do, it's okay. Funny no, no, I, I, I don't mean, I was going to have a whole for not this week, but in the Phoenix, another week I was gonna have like a whole like questionnaire for all of you guys and that was gonna be one of my questions was also do you think he does it <laughs> or not so I I think he but does uh I, I no no you're good I didn't <laughs> didn't mean to steal your thunder <laughs> no 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 I got I, I got a bunch of ideas for this thing it's gonna come out for like before the season starts but gotcha. um okay. I think he does I so yeah so. It re- I'm saying real not like do we like the fact that he's confident because obviously we do but realistically do you think it's possible this year. Yes. Oh, thinking. yeah. It's, it's yes, possible. Okay. possible. Hitting 4,000 yards like, is not that major of an it's accomplishment. Not a hard thing. It, we, we are the only, we're the Bears only franchise <laughs> in the NFL that has yet to have it. By the way, do you guys, Bears trivia note, do you guys know who the uh, single season record holder is for Bears uh, passing yards in the season? Sid Luckman, right? I don't know. Is it like Kramer? No. No. Yep, Eric Kramer. <laughs> What's yeah, Kramer? Yeah. In 1995. Yeah, I know, baby. I know myself. Three <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cutler could never make yards. it through a full season. Yeah, because because Cutler would have if he was healthy that one year or whatever year That's that true. was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that, was that was the year he baby. got sacked. What like twenty times in the Giants game that he was hurt for? It was like, like nine in the first half. Yeah, yeah. I remember that. Disgusting. But anyway, <laughs> um, so the second one I wanted to dig into Eddie Jackson saying that he's going to have the best defensive season yeah, by a safety. Saw ever. that. <laughs> I don't know, man. I'm a little less hopeful about that one. And don't get me wrong, Bojack, I love you, man. I really do. I really do. Hey, he's got to uh, yeah, he's got to feel he's got to feel, you know, like he's just trying to feel the he's trying to generate the, his own vibe and stuff like that. And I, I totally you know, respect that. He shows I hope he does. The past. I, I do too. And I think I think he's capable of it. I think the talent level is there if he has a season like he did the year before he got the contract extension. I think I, I think the reason the main reason I don't think that that's happening where he, he's going to have the best season of his career is that the year he did have the best season of his career in 2018, the Bears had arguably the best defensive line in football. And right. we have one of the worst defensive lines of football right. this year. Still working it, on that edge rusher. It's a lot tougher to play secondary when you're not getting pressure on the quarterback. You know, you can't right. stop the run. It's um that having Khalil Mack at Keem Hicks on that line kind of just let him play, just yeah. play safety and just let him, yeah. you know, ball. He's hawk a ball Hawk. That's let, yeah. That's let him thing. ball Hawk, let him do his thing. Whereas he couldn't really do that once the line got worse. And he, I don't think he can do that now, even though I think like the secondary around him is pretty, he's very good. I think, the bear secondary. I think, it's, whole, I I think really the secondary like. right now is as good as it was in 2018. Talent no, wise. it's not. No, it's not. not I think close. it's. Ooh, Jordan, you got slapped down. The 2018 secondary is very underrated. I feel like. Very, I think awesome. Kyle Fuller was overrated personally, but not uh, that year. No, he was not that. Year. Not that. Not that. That year, he was good. Bryce that Callahan year, was also the best slot healthy. corner. Cal- Callahan was actually healthy. Sweet, yeah. yeah, they were all healthy. Yeah. Kamara was a good. solid second corner. Adrian, yeah, he was, was and then he really fell good. off. Like, yeah. oh, was... I miss that year. <laughs> that defense was so oh, Brisker. Good. I don't. Brisker, Brisker. No, yeah, he's yeah. Uh, Brisker's good, but I don't think he's. I don't think he's, he's there yet. I don't he's not as good, but he's definitely twenty eighteen. I'd say there. Brisker's probably like top 25, 30%. percent. I, I, he's not mid like we were discussing with Cole Komet last week. Um, I think I mean, he'll get there. But he's still got a ways to go. I mean, oh yeah, I mean, he's only in his what? This is his third year. I mean, he's got 
plenty of it's time. Second. For a second he was a yeah. rookie last year. Yeah, he's got plenty of time to get better. Yeah. I, I don't know. I think, I think the potential for this secondary and That's some of the, the thing. It's, it's a younger potential. secondary. It's, it's a potential. younger secondary. It's not off of, we can't go off of proven production. Although our linebackers are better now. I'm so ready for us to go 17 and 0 this year, fellas. I'm just <laughs> I tell you what, I tell you what. Very. I'm gonna. <laughs> so I'm gonna. I'm gonna make a parallel to somebody I follow for a Formula One. Uh, shout out uh, J Bone. He makes a joke about uh, it's. It's called Haas delusion syndrome. And Haas is an F1 team. They're the only American F1 team right now. And everybody kind of jumps on the Haas bandwagon because they're the American team, but dude, they suck so bad. And I, I'm not saying we're going to suck this year, but I think we have a little bit of Bears delusion syndrome. A little bit. There was like a Irish related team in the early 2000s that were always last. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a Ferrari stan and my dad and I was rooting for Ferrari, but like we'd always root for those guys. They'd always just come in. Like if they oh, even, trash, if they even managed to finish the race, you know, it'd always just be dead last. We're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh no anyway. anyways let's move on which got it buttoned up there i will take that as buttoned up all right <laughs> uh moving along some uh bulls news that i actually am a big fan of uh nick if you want to jump into that oh you want, uh you want me to do both stuff or do you want andrew to do both stuff yeah Rock, paper, scissors for it. I don't care. Andrew, go for it. I did flash. <laughs> no. Okay, well. I, I served my nickel. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean, the major news coming from the Bulls is that uh, we have another extension uh, coming up. So, Ao DeSumo uh, got a three-year, $21 million extension from the team. Um, he was a restricted free agent for the Bulls. So, they basically, the Bulls could have matched whatever offer he got out there in the open market, but the uh, both sides are able to come to an agreement. Um, and you know, it's certainly one that got a little bit of an interesting uh, reaction, I felt like, on social media, where I feel like you have the one camp of Bulls fans who are, you know, obviously Illinois fans who've been and Chicago guys. Yeah. A.O. is a Chicago guy, yeah. went to Illinois. Um, I know Nick was pumped up, up about it. I but know. you have those section of fans who are like, um, like, yeah, this is amazing. Like, A.O. is the GOAT. Like, bring him back. <laughs> like, this is an obvious signing to make. We got a steal of a contract. Let AK cook, you know, that type of oh. reaction. Oh. And then, uh, yeah, it made me cringe when I saw some of the, like, it crawled there, a little like, bit. And, uh, yeah, I feel like you're, I feel like you're setting up my group to be the stupid group among the Bulls fans. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. I'm not, no, no. Then there's, and then there's how I reacted to it. And mm. I was like, you know, on the surface, it's not a bad deal whatsoever. Like, $7 million per year for a role player in today's NBA is especially a guy like Ayo who you think can get better is definitely not a bad one to make. It doesn't put the bulls over the luxury tax, which I'm sure Jerry Reinsdorf appreciates. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's also like, I, my, my question to you guys is, is like, and we don't have to get too deep into this, but um, like it just, because the Bulls already made another signing at point guard this offseason with uh, Javon Carter, who basically does the same things that Ao does, where he's a you know tough-minded defensive guard. Um, he can shoot a little bit. Ao can't really shoot right now. That's kind of his main issue on this roster. Um, but I don't know. My reaction was like it's not a bad value on on the surface, but I kind of question like what the point of it was because I don't see a place for him in their rotation. So is this kind of like you're just kind of signing him because you th think he'll be better in the future? Or like, do you actually have a role for him? And I'm just like, I'm kind of confused because I just don't see where the minutes are going to come from. Take it from a guy who watches a lot of basketball. I don't know. Um, I don't know what the Bulls are doing with any of their moves, honestly, Andrew. I don't <laughs> Everything they do just kind of is like, like, it's like, whatever. We're I, just, feel, I feel like we'll it, talk about, we'll talk about, um, I don't know. We'll talk about a move the Hawks made. It's like, okay, yeah, this is the reason behind the move. This is a solid move for the team. And we'll talk about a move the Bears did. It's like, okay, we actually like this draft pick or whatever. It fills a need here. And then we talk about the Bulls and we're like, what the what the hell are they doing? Like, we don't know. Like, it seems I feel like, like and I also I feel like if we were a Sox podcast, because none of us we'd probably do we, the same we'd probably the same way. Yeah. Like it's just that it's a Reinsdorf owned it's, team. Yeah. Man. It's like there's a it's common really, denominator really among those two teams. Yeah, yeah. Oh god, I saw it. 
So, okay. Speaking real quick, just getting into the Ryan Storefone teams and questioning moves and stuff. I saw this really, really funny tweet the other day. Um, there are three GMs who have been tenured for, I believe it was more than 20 years. One of them is Brian Cashman, who has won four World Series yep. with the Yankees and you know numerous division titles, numerous playoff berths, numerous pennants. Um, I can't remember who the second one was, but again, not, not as many world series it was only like one or two world series wins, you know, two or three pennants, numerous playoff berths. This was, and then all, there was, Rick this Hahn. was all MLB, right? Yeah. All MLB. Okay. And then there was Rick Hahn. zero, zero, zero division titles, pennants and world series, zero, zero, zero. So white Sox fans, I am sorry. <laughs> But the yeah, that's, mediocrity in uh, this ownership. Yeah, it, that's that's, that's kind of where I'm at. I'm I'm saying boat is tight. Um, admittedly, I am not the most avid basketball follower, but I do know that 90 percent of the time, if the Bulls are making moves, there's a huh attached to the end of it. <laughs> um, I just I do like it because I'm kind of in the same camp as Nick. I always love it when you get a story of a hometown guy playing for the hometown team. And, you know, hopefully finding success there. Uh, you know, we got to see that with Derrick Rose. Um, we're seeing it on the Cubs with Mike Talkman. Um, the Palatine Pounder. <laughs> you know, Sam Mustafer had a luscious career as the Bears center. Jack Sanborn. <laughs> on a more positive note, Jack Sanborn. TJ Edwards. Cole, uh, Cole Komet. Robert Tanya. Yeah. Yeah. Bob Tanya. <laughs> we're we're, yeah, we're bringing everybody cool. home. I love that. I love that. I, I really like, do yeah, like if you're that. a Bears fan, let's go. Let's yeah. I do like that because <laughs> it's, it's extra motivation for the guy. It's like, you know, you grow up. It, I mean, shit, when we were all playing T-ball, Nick, I think the most fun we had was when we got to wear a fake Cubs uniform because it was, it was the Cubs. It was. You know, um, so I think whenever you bring a hometown guy back, it adds an extra little pinch of motivation that you're not going to be able to get unless they're playing for their hometown team that they grew up watching and, and dreaming of playing for. But same time, yeah, I, the IO signing doesn't really make much sense following the other signings that have happened and yeah. given the current roster situation and all of that. But I do like seeing a hometown guy get to come back and, and play Quick for the sidebar. Team. Nick and I played on a baseball team that never won a single game. That was pretty fun. Was, uh... <laughs> it, was, it was the Cardinals. <laughs> it was the Cardinals. Yeah. Cardinals. That was, well, those, good. those are good memories. I'm glad. So yeah. we did our, we did our job. Uh, My stepmother gave me a participation trophy. Nice. <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah. Just the IO signing. I'm not going to spend too much on it. Cause just, I basically agree with everyone here. I do. I do love my Illinois guys. I do love my hometown guys. But again, if, if you're not going to like, have him in the rotation if you're not going to actually give him minutes and time to develop throughout the season or commit to being like okay we're going to tear it all down we're going to have young guys like io come in we're going to give him like legitimate minutes and see what he can do given the opportunity to get extended time on the court then i don't know what we're really doing here but i yeah. do love to see him back yeah i mean just to put it in perspective like i'm looking at their guard rotation right now i'm assuming lons is out of the picture um, yeah, they've already written them off for next right. year. Yeah. Um, like your point guard right now, it's either going to be Carter or Italian stallion, Alex Caruso. Um, your hey, shooting guard is Nick is the Italian stallion. Okay. <laughs> that is true. Uh, <laughs> Very true. Uh, yeah, but your shooting guard is obviously Zach Levine. Your, your, your shooting guard is Zach Levine and off the bench, you have Kobe white as your, is your backup shooting guard is Zach Levine. They kind of do the same stuff where both are gunners, you know, scoring type guys you know it's nice to have a fifth guard i guess because uh ao can kind of play the one or the two and that's that's nice versatility to have especially defensively but yeah i mean during the during the regular season he's probably gonna get some minutes there's gonna be injuries there's gonna be times where guys are needing some rest throughout the year and whatever it's that's fine whatever but i don't know in a playoff series he's not gonna get any playing time because those guys are gonna be i'd have him bold, of, again, you, bold of you to assume that's a concern for this bulls team I should re I should rephrase that. In a play-in situation, he's okay. not going to get any playing time. <laughs> okay, fair there enough. There we go. How about that? Bold of you to assume even that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, they are gunning for that play-in spot. That's all they care about. That's right. yeah. That and merch. That's right. Well, I think that'll uh, about wrap it up on the Bulls. 
which means it is time to move on to our SWFU, which again, we have been just freaking perfect the last few weeks. Either that or nobody watches our, our videos and uh, doesn't call us out on anything. But if we if you do find out that we have messed something up, uh, feel free to leave it in the comments and we will discuss it in our SWFU segment. So with that being said, we can move on to our four stars of the week. Which order do we want to go start them, Andrew, and then counterclockwise? Well, I know Nick wants. Yeah, Nick I wants I'll, I'll just okay, do. Go ahead, Nick. Oh, Carl. okay, okay. Sorry, I didn't see the okay. note in there. Okay, go yeah, go for okay. it, Nick. You all can right, start. So we'll go our, for our first star of the week. I would give him all the stars if I could, but it is uh, Pat Hughes, radio announcer for the Chicago Cubs. He's been calling Cubs games since 1996, longer than any of us have been alive. So he's been the he's Very been the voice of Cubs baseball on the radio for our entire lives, and. Uh, this past weekend or a couple of days, was it Friday? Was when it uh, was when it happened? I don't know. Whatever. This uh, past Friday or weekend. Saturday. Friday or Saturday. Uh, he was a uh, 47th recipient of the Ford C. Frick Award uh, from the National Baseball Hall of Fame. Pat Hughes. We can now call him Hall of Famer, Baseball Hall of Famer, Pat Hughes. So uh, congratulations to Pat. I know I can't imagine listening to a Cubs game on the radio with anyone else calling it. Thank you, Pat, for all the memories yeah it's gonna be <laughs> i'm not ready for that day no, never <laughs> retire <laughs> be painful. and you know it he really is uh he really is as nice in person as mm -hmm. he seems like on the radio um if i guess we have a little bit of time i'll share a quick pat hughes story not directly me um my ex-girlfriend's family uh goes to cups con pretty much every year and uh her and her sister uh found pat he was walking around and he was going from you know one booth to uh, uh an event that he had to go to inside cubs con and he basically just let them follow him around in between going to places uh so that they could talk to him for a couple of minutes and, and get a quick picture with him so uh he is really just one of the nicest people on planet earth as well as being just an incredible radio announcer um you know, it, I, it is going to be a sad day when he finally decides to retire because I really can't think of anybody else I'd rather have in the Cubs booth with, uh, with Coomer. So anyway. All right, Andrew. <laughs> yeah, our second star of the week is going to be, uh, I think we had him last week as a star, but Cody Bellinger uh, is a star of the week again. He's just been, you know, hitting the piss out of the ball over the last couple weeks or so, really all season long. But you look at his last five games, he's got – two home runs over that stretch, uh, nine RBIs, uh, just really hitting the ball well. And right now you look at his season as a whole, like all the stats are looking pretty much back up to where he was as an MVP level player with the Dodgers. You know, he's got a 918 OPS. His OPS, OPS plus is 145 right now. So, yeah, he's he's back to looking. We talked about before plenty of times, but he's back to looking like the old – Cody Bellinger, it's going to be interesting to see like what happens with his future years of Cub. We certainly hope that they can work out something long term, but uh, for the meantime, like he's he's killing it out there. He looks he looks really good. All right, Tag, I'm going to make you go next because it's ironic. Yeah, <laughs> that's, <probably, laughs> hey, that's the thing though. That's the thing is, is that's what we've that's what we've been hoping for because the start, start of the week goes to Jameson Tyone. Um, he had a great outing against the Cardinals. <laughs> I think he went uh, six innings strong with like only giving up one run. Um, he threw like a bit over a hundred pitches, but it's finally you know we talk. Sometimes you got to talk about trust in the process. Tommy Hadovy, uh, you know, I didn't really know like I didn't really care for him. I guess when we first got him because I guess I was you know so used to our dominance with our pitchers. But uh, when you talk about like trust in the process and trust in the coaching, like Tommy Hadovy knows what he's doing with all these guys. I think he's really. I think how do we saw Tyone as a guy that he had to kind of maybe project a little bit <clears throat> and it kind of stunk because like Tyone is like an MLB level pitcher. So like, it's just kind of like, all right, man, get out there and <laughs> throw some cookies up. But uh, I think he's finally really starting to unlock what Tyone's supposed to be. And like I said, I said it when we were criticizing him, but like Tyone does not have to be the superstar rotation guy. Right. Just give us five, six innings of three to four ERA ball, we'll take it, man. And I think finally, and I mean, he's been stellar the past few outings. He blanked, you know, his former team, the Yankees, he's, he did well in this outing. Um, so hopefully going forward, 
uh, this deal is worth it <laughs> because we did give him a kind of a nice chunk of change. We did. So, you know, it's kind of like, Hey, you're, you know, you were this huge prospect coming in and, and now it's time to kind of, you know, we give you this money. So live up to it. So this star of the week goes to Jameson Tyone. We'd like to add, he's got a sub two, uh, sub, sub 2.0 ERA in his last three starts as well. Yeah. So really uh, seems to be turning a corner and speaking of turning a corner and, Harkening back to our earlier discussion about the roller coaster that the Cubs seem to like to put us on, Seiya Suzuki gets our final start of the week because he's on a bit of a hot streak. Uh, he's been hitting above 300 since coming back from the All Star break, and uh, all all the stats are are up since the All Star break. Uh, it was a pretty big contributor against the Cardinals, and not as big as Belly, but definitely had a few uh, clutch ABs in there as well. So our final start and some great week, outfield plays oh by the my way God, his jumps yeah. were very good so yeah i, I forgot oh, which reasons. who did he rob a, a double from when he was running in the right field i don't, I don't know, know he, but he he's doing well now he's playing great in the outfield and we all know wrigley is not an easy place to play the corner outfield spots and Saya has been rock solid all year so uh Saya, you get our fourth star of the week and now moving into our final and fan favorite segments, we'll go to the complete 180 where we all get to talk about whatever we want in this world <laughs> for three minutes. So, Andrew, if you want to kick it off, I will turn the floor over to you. Yeah, so for uh, the subject of my 180, I'm going to focus on one of the major headlines going on in the NFL right now, major storylines, and that is uh, Dan Snyder, the owner of the Washington Commanders, Washington football team, wherever you want to call them. He is officially selling the team. We're in the process of finalizing a, a sell of uh, the franchise to a ownership group led by the Magic Johnson, actually. Uh, so... So Dan Snyder, no longer the owner there for that football team in Washington. And it sounds like they're going to be rebranding the team actually pretty soon. So I kind of hope they put it back to Washington football team just because why not? Um, but so to prepare this segment, I have an open letter prepared here uh, to Dan Snyder personally, uh, who is one of the trashiest, worst owners in all of team sports. Um <laughs> So here we go. Dear Dan Snyder, after 25 years as the owner of the Washington football team, all NFL fans rejoice as your reign of terror officially ends. It's hard to fathom really how bad of a figure in the sport of football you have been, but congratulations. You joined the likes of Don Sterling and Ted Stepien, among the many others, as one of the worst owners in team sports history. You were so bad, you made Jerry Reinsdorf look like a competent team owner, and that is very difficult to do. With your time owning an NFL team coming to an end, I will take this time to go over some of your illustrious accomplishments through the years. For one, I'm not sure there has been an NFL franchise with a stretch of ineptitude quite like yours during your time. During the time seen over, Washington has been known much more for wasting tons of money on bad free agent signings than their team successes. Hell, one of the biggest on-field storylines of your team was when Albert Hainsworth was not able to complete a basic conditioning test that I could have done on a bad day. And as Nick knows, I don't do much conditioning. It's like two days of basketball maybe per week. Otherwise, I'm sitting on the couch just putting back beers and not doing anything. So the fact that Albert Hainsworth <laughs> – And confirm. Your highest, paid, your highest paid player couldn't do that is, is pretty – pretty telling um to put washington's lack of team success in perspective snyder your organization has had more investigations than playoff wins during your time as team owner so <laughs> yes. it's just it's 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 rough buddy um but you know in terms of the on-field stuff you know that's really not why we're having this conversation it's really the off-field stuff over your 25 years washington has been nothing but a PR nightmare for the NFL, whether it is you stubbornly clinging on to a racist slur as your team name until advertisement dollars came at stake um, before you ended up making a change and then making it like the worst like <laughs> team name change ever. Like commanders, like, come on, man, you couldn't think of something better than that. Jeez. Um, and then there's that situation. And then whether it's that or pipping out your cheerleaders to the highest bidder, uh, a woefully maintained stadium, and just the general sleaziness of your team culture where sexual harassment runs amok. Uh, there has been nothing but trouble coming from you and your woeful mismanagement over the years. So good riddance. And I hope the door hits you on the way out. Sincerely, <laughs> Andrew Freeman. You know, the culture is it's pretty actually good. <laughs> good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would like to mention two specific things that Andrew did not specifically address 
in his open letter, which very well written. Honestly, bravo. I loved it. Um, the poop water getting rained on fans at FedEx Field, which you kind of hinted at, but you didn't did specifically – you hinted at it, but you did not say that a pipe full of raw sewage burst on fans at FedEx yes. Field. Um, and then we left out that the uh, email scandal that ruined John Gruden's career, <laughs> rightfully so, stemmed from the commander's organization. So That's just true. a couple other little tidbits to, to add on there. <laughs> God, how pissed must John Gruden be? He's like, <laughs> now? Now you get him. Yeah. You get him out well, now. <laughs> so the the really screwed up part is he bought that team for less than a million dollars twenty five years ago, and now it's worth like seven billion dollars. Yeah. So he's still he's still winning in the end. He's winning, still winning in the end, yeah. which sucks. Yeah. But thank God he's out of the league because they don't need that anymore. No, no. they have enough issues as it is. Yeah, make me the owner. I can I can fix that franchise. <laughs> I play a lot of Madden. I got this. <laughs> I'll take they $7 a team million only, dollars or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I will go next. Um, and mine, I I need to eat a bit of crow this week. Uh, before I moved to Arizona, my joke with everybody that I thought I was being sincere with was, oh, you know, when it's 115 degrees, at least there's always a pool to go swimming in. It's not negative 30 degree wind chills. I'd rather be in the heat than the cold, and it's a dry heat, so it's really not that bad. I was wrong. <laughs> I was wrong. It has been 115 degrees for two weeks straight, and it's not stopping. It is not stopping. And let me tell you, I was – so it, it, you guys will remember I, I asked if it was a good idea to go to a club in Old Town Scottsdale by myself. It's not really a club. It's just like a bar that has bands and stuff in is by the clubs. But anyway, so I was going to go to this place in Old Town Scottsdale, which is walking distance from my apartment. Uh, however, when it was 105 degrees at 10 p.m., because I am certainly not spending $20 on an Uber both ways to go to somewhere by myself or, you know, try and find parking and, you know, it, no, no. So uh, I, I was wrong. Dry heat does still suck. Um, it, that it, honestly, I, I would be able to put up with it if it was 115 during the day and, you know, being the good Midwestern boy that I am, I'm used to, you know, 95, hundred during the day in the summer, but then when the sun goes down at, you know, 75, you can still have a bonfire. You can still wear a hoodie. Uh, uh nope. 105 degrees at 10 PM. Jordan, I hear you, buddy. However, comma, I've worn body armor in that heat. Okay. <laughs> I'm just saying like. And, and sir, thank you it. for your service. <laughs> However, <laughs> no, I I, uh, I definitely need to eat crow. I should have listened more. Um, this does suck. And come to think of it, I so I think I still bad. have a minute or minute and a half, so I'll just go off on a little tangent here. Um, so I, I binge watched The Bear, which for those of you, if you haven't seen it, it's set in Chicago, and it's about a. Um, opening a, a restaurant and restaurant life and whatever, but set in Chicago. And I was missing the snow downtown, man. I was thinking about it. I was like, oh, Chris, Chris Kendall market when it's snowy and you got, you know, all the little village buildings and everything. It's so pretty. And uh, yeah. Yeah. It's 115 every day and 105 at 10 PM with the sun down. So yeah, I'm eating crow. <laughs> well, I didn't think that he. I mean, you you do have to get used to it. It is pretty intense, though. I don't it's think you're getting here. used to it. I don't think you're getting used to it. No, it's you just, do. You just gotta... have to leave your apartment a little bit. Yeah, stay hydrated. <laughs> Ooh, Ouch. Still walking. Yeah. Yeah, Anyways, me, me with uh, my bustling social life. <laughs> yeah, put on some sunblock. Um, for my I 180, I will get into my 180, but I do want to mention real quick to prepare the fans. Uh, Roger Waters, formerly of Pink Floyd, is re-recording Dark Side of the Moon by himself. Um, and he released the song Money, and it is horrible. <laughs> so I'm not going to talk about it now for my 180. That's going to come later when he releases the whole album. I will give you all the full review. I don't want to. I don't want to listen to this thing. The, just going off it. money alone, will be, but I will, will do it. torturing himself for our I will do it. Yeah, and I will do it multiple times if I have to to get every perfect point. Anyways, that's all I want to say. A little teaser. Um, friends, if you don't know, uh, the NFL running backs have kind of had a little issue, right? Running backs feel like they're not getting valued enough. Um, I'm not going to go into super deep 
dive it because you can just look it up. But basically, running backs feel like they're not getting paid enough. It's a very brutal position. It's a short-lived position. Uh, and a lot of teams just kind of feel like it's not worth it because you can see some of these bad deals where a running back gets extended for five years even for way too much money, and they immediately fall off a cliff. So these running backs kind of went to complaining a little bit on Twitter, and they want to talk about what they can do to improve their situation. And I think I have the solution. And if, you know, everybody would just listen to me, I think we can all uh, do it together. So I'm going to share my screen with what I think <laughs> is going to uh, oh, go. figure out this solution. How do I do this now? Here we go. Yeah. Uh, if you notice here, the triple option. <laughs> hold on, hold on. You did. There we go. There we go. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Uh, it's God's gift to football. Now, for those of you who don't know, uh, I don't know why every team doesn't just run the triple option. Uh, it's literally a can't lose <laughs> <laughs> offense. Um, so my theory here is we could get somebody like, I don't know, Saquon Barkley right there, Christian McCaffrey right there. Uh, I don't know, man. Ezekiel Elliott right there. It doesn't matter. Just get all the running backs. You can even put them at wide receiver. It doesn't matter because nobody throws the ball in triple option. Um, and just just go with that. That that's I think our solution. You bought you you pay like six running backs a bunch of money, and you just rotate them in to all the positions <laughs> and just run flex bone, wish bone, whatever you want to with the triple option. It's the perfect offense. Now you may be saying, well, Ty. I mean, surely it's not going to work every time. You're going to need a quarterback, Terry. Oh, that's the beauty of it, too. Make this quarterback a running back. There you go. <laughs> that already solves your issues. But then you might be like, well, eventually you're going to need a quarterback, tear it out. And you'd be correct. So I do have a solution for that as well. Uh, I don't know how to change the screen. Let me just stop his sharing name real is quick. Tyreek Cohen. No, 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 not yet. Uh, let me just uh, reshare here. I think I got a quarterback just for the job. Uh, and once it starts, you guys let me know. <laughs> <can already> see it. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. No. Look, he's cheap, right? A lot of the triple option passing oh. concepts, take it from a guy that played in high school and we ran the triple option offense. <laughs> a lot of the passing concepts really are just uh, rollouts because you want to look like you're running the triple option and then you just roll it out and then you just throw it. So it's all one side of the field. Real easy for Mitchell to learn. You pay him a cheap, what, $5 million contract. You pay all the running backs. I don't see how this can lose, fellas. I really don't. <laughs> you hold on to the ball. The plan is you hold on to the ball for 45 minutes time of possession, and you score twice, and you never punt, and uh, you just win football games 14 to 8. Uh, and I don't see any reason why this shouldn't work. So that's my solution to fixing this running back dilemma. Uh Opinions. <laughs> okay. Question. Question about Mitch being the quarterback. Yes, you, sir. You mentioned these passing concepts. Yes, Do sir. Any of these passing concepts require your quarterback to throw the ball more than ten yards? No, that's the brilliance of it. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. That was my only reservation. <laughs> yeah, I'm no. not for it otherwise. It's all. It's all overs. Hitches and like little flat routes, man. That's all it is. It literally, it's like, God, I hated it. I hated. <laughs> I just, uh, I just want to give you props for your yeah. Brett Coleman impression. That was, that was very. Nice. I don't even know that I was doing a Brett Coleman impression. So there we go. So there we go. Uh, I mean, my, no. my next, my question would yes. be whether Mitch can actually read a read option. I know it's like high school level football, but I mean. Well, that's the th I mean, well, okay, that's a good point. Now, that's why, so, <laughs> <laughs> so that's why, like, 85% of the snaps, I'd rather have Christian McCaffrey under center. Uh, uh, okay. but <laughs> that fixes it. Okay, that fixes most of it. But that's the brilliance because then, if you know, you bring Mitch in, they're like, oh, they're going to pass. Well, at least he can still run the ball a little bit. Um, yeah. So, triple option. Uh, in all seriousness, I did enjoy it. I think it's a fun offense. I did play in high school. Um, it is not the perfect offense it is usually used by smaller offenses to try to offset the negatives of being a bunch like a smaller offense but it was fun it is kind of it's 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 awesome when it works like when you do get a game where like you're just running it up it's like the greatest feeling in the world because it in theory it can't be stopped but um it is a fun offense to do it's fun to watch in college and high school and i do wish that i could see some nfl team just doing the flex bone <laughs> that would just be awesome that would, that would make my heart so happy but you're never going to see it ever so Ty, I, i'll retort as someone who played a uh, tight end of that offense who hated blocking and only liked receiving i hated that offense yeah oh like, yeah the one no. thing i didn't like doing i like honestly like i would feel so bad for our wide receivers because like you're never getting the ball <laughs> like you did the wrong position i don't know how they did it I don't know either. 
it, it, oh gosh it, like i said a lot of fun when it works um it definitely kind of takes some selfless like team attitude because unless you're a running back or a flex back you're you're never touching that ball <laughs> or the quarterback of course so yeah cool all right nick how'd your homework assignment go <laughs> all right so last week so if you didn't listen last week uh i went on a little tangent about how i think mlb has broken the home run derby and um how they and i gave some you know pointers and how they maybe should fix it and then jordan gave me the homework uh assignment for my 180 this week to do the ricky vaughn memorial home run derby and uh i'm gonna be honest i didn't do that i didn't want to do that (laughs) so i didn't want to do that i was just like you know what i left a nice little you know framework out there you know just go back to the 10 outs but do use some time control so it doesn't take 47 years to get through it i think that's good enough whatever so for my 180 this week I want to talk about former MLB, MLB infielder Jeff Fry. Now, if you've never heard of him before, it's because he kind of sucked. But he caused a <laughs> bit of a stir on Twitter today. Um, he shared a video of uh, Luca Ramirez, who is the son of former Red Sox slugger Manny Ramirez. He hit a walk-off home run in whatever league he's playing in. I don't know the league he's playing in. And, you know, as you tend to do when you hit a walk-off home run, he showed a bit of emotion. He got excited. He, you know... Yeah, I think, let uh, the kids play. The, so. the technical term for what he did and part in the French is he pimped the shit out of that home run. <laughs> okay. He pimped the shit out of the home run. <laughs> um anyway, our anyway, our boy Jeff here said uh, uh boy Jeff Fry, uh his tweet, I'm just gonna read it. He said, Thanks at MLB for encouraging kids to act foolishly on a baseball field. I'm sure this young man has a bright young future, but I played against his dad who was a great hitter and I never saw him do this. So first of all, for, first of all, set aside the yeah, whole right. dumb old man yells at cloud. Look, ask these guys. I'm usually the old man yelling at clouds when it comes to these old school things. I like old school baseball, whatever, but like let the kids, I'm fully on the side to let the kids play, let them have fun, let them show emotion, let them make the game fun. But that's not really what I want to talk about. This man claims to have played against Manny Ramirez and (laughs) never seen him pimp a home run. Are you kidding me? If you search Manny Ramirez home run on YouTube, the first result is a top 10 list put out by the Red Sox of the top 10 home runs uh, Manny hit as a member of the Red Sox. He pimps out over half of them. (laughs) I'm not joking. (laughs) So that on Um, its face is... That on its face is just ridiculous, but I'm just going to close by this, and you guys can comment on it. I don't think a guy that hit 16 home runs in his career should be lecturing a kid that's probably going to hit more than that in his first full season in the bigs on how he should behave when he hits big home runs. So uh, sit down, Jeff. Just sit down. <laughs> I the whole phrase, Manny being Manny, that was, was yeah. not created for Manny Machado. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was Manny Ramirez. <laughs> I love, yeah, I love because I saw that same thing. So when you, because I didn't know what you're doing with yours, Nick. And then when you started talking, I was like, oh, nice. He is. There was one, uh, somebody respond, like retweeted, quote with my brother in Christ. He literally started taking his gloves off before I even like, like, like you see Ramirez, like hit the home run and he starts taking off his batting gloves. Like, yeah, yeah, that one's gone. Like, come on, dude. Are you kidding me? Like, <laughs> that was his man. thing. That's that was what he thing. did. He was, he was like one of the pimpers before it became uh more you know mainstream stuff like that like uh we can go into a whole nother discussion later but like uh, for example like i feel like bryce harper kind of took like a little bit of fall for harper coming up being again a younger guy now marine is even older than harper but like you know harper comes up tries to be that guy and kind of has to pay the price of everybody's like he's not playing the game right and now look at now you know you got all these guys he, having a... he ended that one pitcher's career <laughs> for throwing at him after hitting yeah him. well <laughs> Harper's under many degrees, so he's awesome. But anyways, Manny Ramirez, awesome ball player. I mean, I forget all the time. I'll forget all the time. And then, like, I'll watch the Manny Ramirez highlights, oh, yeah. and I'm he like, how good was this guy? And then you look it up, and he is Hall he's of Famer. Legit. I mean, he's he a was, power hitter. He His he was, swing. No, he's so sweet. sweet. He had some help on the power front, if you know what I mean. Cough, cough. So did Ortiz. So did Ortiz. So did Ortiz. Yeah, Literally I don't care. Everybody from that era did it. Like, and the yeah. writers let it happen. They did not. And only, and only the Red Sox hitters are allowed in the Hall like, of Fame. The yeah, and literally, fans, and so. literally every hitter, like some of the hitters today, they're on stuff too. It's not like that to that degree, but like if you don't think that Mike Trout isn't taking some supplements, you're wrong. <laughs> like they're all taking right. something, dude. Their bodies would break. They'd retire by 27. Just enjoy the game. 
go to the game, get some beers, get some food, whatever. You know, you know, hot tank <laughs> watching guys hit lots of dingers is a lot of fun. Kind of good for the Chicks game. Dig the long yeah. ball. Chicks Chicks dig it, the that's long the ball. reason. So I don't know. That's a great 180. I love it. Go Manny. Sit yeah, down. I'm okay with it. I, I was <laughs> I was kind of upset for a second when you said you didn't do it. I, I, I mostly just wanted it because of the the name, the Ricky Vaughn Memorial home run. I'm not gonna give but. you the satisfaction. If you come up with the name. You come up with the clever idea. Ooh. Ooh. I said, do you want me to do it or do you want to do it? And then you said, well, I guess I got to do it. So I Okay, really well, I changed it. my mind because I realized <laughs> I didn't want to do it. <laughs> All right. Well, on that note, anybody else got anything uh, they want to come nah, before we sign off? Here. All right. Well, thank you all once again for watching. This was episode lucky number 13. <laughs> so, uh, as always... I am your host, Jordan Dupont, joined by Nick DeCola, Ty Mullen, and Andrew Freeman. You can check us out on Twitter at 4 CHI, on the interwebs, uh, 4 CHI.com. Nick on Twitter is at ndecola21. Ty is at tmmullen007. Andrew is at ajfreeman25. And you can check out his other work for the Bear Report on 247sports.com and the Picks for Polls podcast. Dang, that was a good one. <laughs> We'll uh, be back here again next week, ranting and raving. Thank you so much and enjoy your week.